How's everybody doing out there? Sir. Hey. How's Oops. everybody doing out there? Sir. Hey. How's Oops. everybody doing out there? I'm gonna start an echo war Sir. with my computer if I do How's this. Everybody doing out there? I'm gonna start an echo war Sir. with my computer if I do How's this. Okay. <laughs> should be working now. Uh, should be working now. Uh, sorry, a little slow today. Now. They were coming through the labs. Uh, sorry, and a little uh, slow today. Yeah, I'm gonna they were do loops now. Coming looping through the labs. A little slow today. Yeah, I mean, they were science loops now. Just coming through the labs. A little slow today. Science loops now. Just coming through the labs. They were coming through, through the labs today to do inventory. So they had to check. They were coming through the labs to this lab. And so they had to check. They were coming through the labs to this lab. It helps to find their Yeah, that instrument doesn't belong to this lab. I don't know why. They close captioning. They close captioning. Well, hopefully it stops. Close captioning. It should stop echoing once I turn the volume. Well, hopefully it stops. Close captioning. It should stop echoing once I turn the volume. So normally I have my headphones. I forgot. So normally I have my headphones. When they were coming through, so we have a new. Normally I have my headphones. When they were administrative assistant, she started asking me questions. So we have a new. Normally I have my headphones. When they were administrative assistant, she started asking me questions. What I do in here. And then it will be asked about what I do in here. So, uh, how's it going? So, uh, so, uh, so uh, how's it going? So, uh, how's it going? So, uh, how's it going? And uh, you should follow Ping. They do some uh, some cool stuff. You should follow Ping. Hopefully, the reverberation stop. Cool stuff. You should follow Ping. Hopefully, the reverberation sounds now. Cool stuff. Hopefully, the reverberation So, hopefully, the reverberation. Pink does some. So, hopefully, the reverberation. Pink does some. So, hopefully, the reverberation. Pink does some. So, still I don't know. It shouldn't be looping at all now. I don't know. It shouldn't be looping at all now. I don't know. If you're listening to it on mobile, maybe it's creating a. I don't know. If you're listening to it on mobile, maybe it's creating a. I don't know. If you're listening to it on there's nothing to loop at this point. The sound is off here. There's nothing to loop at this point. The sound is off here. There's nothing to loop at this point. Sound is super weird. I mean, it turned off the microphone and everything for a bit. I mean, it turned off the microphone and everything for a bit. <laughs> Shouldn't be looping. Is the loop? Uh, that's a cool one. Well, now there's nothing to loop. It should just be the straight sound coming out. Is it still looping? Okay. I don't know why I was doing that. The desktop is just going nuts uh, here. Just maybe the sounds are uh, uh, the sounds are messed up as a result. But um, OBS just decided it was going to do whatever it wanted to for uh, for the last fifteen to twenty minutes. So I haven't made any. Uh, I don't know what happened. It just went nuts, and apparently it messed up my sound as well. But uh, hopefully it's fixed now. Um, since I just have no sound coming out of my computer whatsoever. Um, yeah, OBS, you know how it is. <laughs> hey, Anna. <laughs> um, today we're looking at uh, some material that my colleague Andy Alverson sent me. And um, this Thalassia Syra comes from a culture. Uh, and before this point, I've never looked at cultured material. Um, what that means in science terms is that um, they are growing it in a lab and so they try to prepare conditions in the water that would be beneficial for the growth of an organism and then you know so they dump nutrients in they keep the temperature it's like growing fish right except for you're growing algae and uh, and then they they have their own diatom culture. So rather than going out into nature to get a sample, they can just basically grab it from their culture in their lab. And one of the things that happens when you culture things 
is that the organisms aren't in a natural environment. And even though you can add things that would be seemingly the right things to make their environment correct, um, sometimes they just do crazy things and you end up with these sort of weird beasties that they don't fully form or they don't form correctly or um, and any number of things might happen. So um, I, I think that uh, these were originally collected from natural sources and then, um, and then they uh, isolated the species that they were interested in growing Hey, Chippy Flip, hello. Um, and then, um, and then they, uh, they have it in the lab where they can collect the material whenever they need to. And, um, good shout out, shout outs to Chippy Flip. <coughs> and, uh, there's one for, um, Cyanophyte as well. And Joseph Radio Joe, who uh, helped us out early here with the sound reverberations. Um, it was a pretty cool space photo that was an image of the, uh, uh, the International Space Station with somebody like on the outside of it uh, that someone had taken from the ground from planet Earth. Um, anyway, so these cultures are ones that they can then use to, you know, if they want to analyze the genetic code or um, they want to have their own collections. And I'm not particularly sure why Andy wanted me to image them. Uh, maybe he's just trying to figure out what they are because sometimes you collect stuff and then you just pull out, isolate individuals and then um, you can use those to, you know, later on you can figure out what they are to species. Uh, and I think maybe that's in part what he's hoping to do is to figure out what these things are, but they've been growing in his lab for a long time. So, um, they may be off completely off the rails, you know, they may be something that's not, um, creating itself correctly in replication. So, uh, I, I don't know. I'm not responsible for the monstrosities that he's making. I'm just trying to collect some images for him. And he sent me four samples. And on Monday, I was looking through um, some of them with him. Uh, he was just on Zoom, and I was just streaming into Zoom for him uh, while we were chatting about it. And we got maybe an hour, an hour and a half of stuff done. And I said, well, I don't know if you want me to put this stuff on Twitch or out on the internet. And he's like, oh, I don't care. So here we are. We're looking at some of the stuff. Um, and these are just some images I'm collecting from him. Um, <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, so, uh, some of the things in here, like all of the things in here should be clones of the same organism. But one of the samples, the material was super small, and um, I'm not sure that we actually have any of it um, that was preserved very well. And so, um, I'm, I'm working on going back through. And so when we process the sample, I had my lab technician split it in half, so only half went into what we were actually processing, and so I have half of the original sample that was sent to me, and um, because the part that we got doesn't look very good, like there's not enough of the organisms or, um, or there, something may have happened when we were processing them, so um, cleverly I always keep a little bit of it so that in case that happens we can um, double check right, see what's going on. And then I don't have to bother the people who send me stuff with some more material. And in, in this case, uh, we'll probably have to go back and take a look at some of the stuff from the original split that didn't get processed. So I'm going to um, do that, and I was planning on doing it today, and probably if I had just a little more time, I would have been able to get around to doing it. Um, but uh, if Andy, if you're out there watching this, uh, we'll see what we can do about first processing it, um, trying it unprocessed and then trying uh, a little bit of it um, completely unprocessed and, and then sort of see. But I have to rinse the samples because they're cultured in salt water because the Thalassiosyra and organisms that we're looking at mostly prefer salt water. 
And if I just went ahead and put them on a stub or a slide, the salt crystals would actually uh, crystallize out of the water as it evaporates. So um, there's a little bit of prep time that I still need to do rinsing the sample to try to get the salt water out. And then um, maybe next time, or maybe I'll just try to get it done before the weekend um, or, or during the weekend or next Monday or something. So um, if it doesn't work out, then I'll just have to have Andy send me some more of the material. Um, so I collected this image and like it's been sitting here for a long time. Uh, fully developed, so we should probably move on. Um, this are these little tiny things that we're looking at um, is as Anna mentioned, uh, Thalassus Syrah and um, Thalassus Syrah look like this uh, in the light microscope and you can click that link if you're interested in wondering what a, um, how would you determine what is a Thalassus syra? But they're usually characterized by the presence of one Rimaporchula, which is um, on this organism that we're looking at. It's this thing right here. Um, and if I zoom in, you'll see it's, it's not very impressive as a, uh, a thing that we're just looking at um, as a feature, but in the diatom realm, um, when they're looking at these really small things, um, we determine a lot of the genera and the species based on these really um, small processes that occur. And um, this process over here, so process is basically just something that goes through the valve wall or through the cell wall of the organism. Um, these things over here are called photoportula or sometimes referred to as strutted processes. And um, they get that name because these little tiny struts that stick out um, associated with these tiny little holes. So they're always identified by having one larger hole in the middle and then a bunch of satellite holes around the outside edge. And they may have two, three, four, five, or six. I don't think I've ever seen more than six little holes around the outside, but that's usually characteristic of, uh, of the species. So this one has four. And then they have these little tiny coverings that go over the process. Um, these ones are just little tiny, like thorn-like things that are built, in, built out of the, um, the central tube. And then this tube goes all the way through to the outside. That's how we identify something as a process. It starts on the inside of the cell wall and it goes all the way through to the outside. And so when we get an outside view of this diatom, you'll be able to see what it looks like on the outside, but it's basically, on the inside it's just a hole with like a little donut with um, little holes around it that are linked with it and it covers over them, the satellite pores. And then this thing uh, is the labiate process, which is uh, another useful component of the genus, the Lassiosira. Um And it's basically looks like a little mouth and this one's kind of sideways and you can't see it very clearly. Um, but there's a slit that runs down the middle of this um, piece of silica here and then it has sort of the shape of a fan almost, like a, you know, like a fan you might fan yourself with. Um, but they look like two little lips, basically. And then um, it also is a process. The Rimaporchula has an opening that goes all the way through to the outside. And um, so those are uh, distinct processes. They start on the inside, they go through to the outside. And then there's another um, bit of terminology here, which is relevant which is these little tiny salt and pepper shaker like openings that you can see here. Um, and there's a set of sets of them all around on the surface are called areoli. And they're just um, uh, like a simple covering over a hole that goes to the outside. Um, and the simple covering part is called a cribra um, with a bunch of little tiny holes like a salt and pepper shaker. Um, and these are mostly used um, if people are asking that question. These are mostly used to communicate with the outside world, um, not by like text messaging them, but um, but like to pull nutrients in or um, squeeze waste products out um, or to bring in dissolved uh, gases, for example. 
and then um, this thing, we're not totally sure what the room of Portugal is used for, but usually people think of it as being responsible for helping to um, put the nucleus of centric diatoms in the middle of the valve, and it's used sort of like as an anchor point to allow them to, um, to divide. But why that needs to also have an opening to the outside is unknown to me. Maybe somebody knows. And these little mantophotoportula usually are used to sort of squeeze out some um, protoplasm or cytoplasm uh, into the outside realm, and they kind of baffle the descent of the organism a little bit because these are um, planktonic single-celled organisms. So um, this junk that's over here is just some organic junk, maybe, um, that's stuck on the side of the valve. Um, didn't dissolve off when we put this thing in nitric acid originally, um, or it's a piece of dust that was in the water that just basically got trapped on, um, on that material. So because we're looking at things in the scanning electron microscope, they have a topography and they have an inside and an outside. And so um, that view that we were looking at was the inside of the cell wall. So think of it like a little bowl, um, right? And then um, sometimes we'll see them from the inside and sometimes we'll see them from the outside. This is another view of the inside. So you can tell it's like a cup shaped. And, um, and then there's uh, some processes here. Uh, there's the rim of Portula again. Um, and then there's a bunch of some organic junk that's around in this one. Um, and what I'm looking for now is an external view so I can sort of show you what they look like from the outside. That is also an internal view, but it gives us a good view of the girdle bands. And you can see, it's a kind of nice when you get the, um, the views where you have a three quarter view of what's going on, because you can see the inside of the valve and the processes here, and then the outside of the valve. And there are the external expressions of um, the mantle photoportula, the little openings that um, have the satellite pores around them. You can see them right um, here coming over the edge of the valve. Oops, hang on, I'm just trying to get it close enough so I can focus it perfectly. And then I'm going to center it, and then I'm going to zoom in a bit. So we can see a bit of the girdle bands, which are these sort of um, pieces of silica that wrap around the outside of the valve and often hold the valves, uh, the two halves of the diatom skeleton together. And, um, and then we can see the inside of one of the valves and then a little bit of the outside of that valve. And I think you can think of the valve as basically for these diatoms as kind of little bottle caps. So um, they have that sort of a shape to them. And so we know we're looking into the bottle cap, right, rather than um, on the outside of it. Um, okay, I haven't seen any comments, so I'll just roll with what we're doing. Uh, this needs to be on this. I'm doing a little bit of uh, adjustment to the light settings right now. Um, so the scanning electron microscope is actually pretty good at um, getting the brightness and the contrast sort of balanced, um, which is, you know, like a photography skill set. So something that I normally would do manually. But um, what I do is just let it figure out what it thinks is a good choice. And as long as I'm, I think it's acceptable enough, then I will uh, usually do some editing in uh, Photoshop or, or Adobe Lightroom later to try to fix the brightness and contrast so that it's perfect for publication or for, or for uh, you know, just distributing the image. Um, but I think this is fine. Um, you can see the external expressions right here of the uh, mantle photoportula pretty clearly. And then these are the girdle bands that are wrapped around and you can see um, they have these structures on them called uh, ligula, 
and antiligula that are um, like little tongues that cover over the previous one and it actually lets you tell what order they stacked the girdle bands on if you're really really interested in the minutia um, for how it's doing that and um, and then you can see on the inside here the, the these are the shredded processes on the inside of the diatom. There is also a central shredded process in this diatom. Um, and then these are the outside expressions of those same features. So that's kind of cool to be able to see inside and outside of the diatom at the same time. And that way you can link those pieces together. And that's one of the things that's really kind of a challenge about using a scanning electron microscope is that um, Normally I look at stuff in the light microscope. Most scientists who study diatoms look at them in the light microscope. They're too small to see for the most part. Um, almost all of them are too small to see in hand sample. But um, you can see them in the light microscope well enough. But the problem with the light microscope is most light microscopes are transmitted light microscopes that we're using that are powerful enough to actually see the diatoms. And um, and it's basically like an x-ray, right? So it's, imagine you only saw human beings as, uh, as their skeletons, right? You can't see their facial features. You can't see any of the things on the surface of their skin. You could only see their bones by looking through them. And then trying to figure out, like once you could start to see with your actual eyes, the reflectance of the surface of those people, um, like what they actually look like, right? We would, we would think of that as, you know, the similar sort of structure. We're looking through things normally, and then we've got to figure out the relationship between the thing that we were looking through and now the thing that actually has a topography to it. So it's a bit of a challenge. And sometimes finding the link between what you see on the inside of a valve and what you see on the outside of a valve is kind of a challenge um, for, for people, um, including me. Sometimes it's just it's a challenge to try to figure that out. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm glad that it's uh, s at least stimulating your brain a little bit, Pink. Um, you know, we're, it's a science stream, so we're always aiming to try to uh, uh, capture people's um, interest and showcasing the power of the scanning electron microscope because we're looking at things that... Um, so this particular sample that we're looking at is being viewed at uh, 27,000 times. So that's the other issue. A normal microscope, you see things at, um, you know, at most 1,000 times magnification. Um, even in some of the best microscopes, that's all you're going to see. And so it's equivalent to like looking up at the stars and just seeing like a dot, right? Versus being able to see an actual planet or an actual galaxy with a telescope. And um, it's pretty different, right? If you just looked up and you saw a dot and you're like, I guess that's Jupiter. Uh, <laughs> and then you look at Jupiter in a, a really high powered telescope. Um, it's a pretty different um, understanding of what's going on. So, uh, this is order view, turn on. Girdle. Okay, let's see what else we can find. So one thing that's different about these samples than any samples that I've ever looked at on uh, on the stream before is there's only one thing in them um, because they were collected in a culture and the culture was basically raised up from a few or a single cell. Um, there shouldn't be anything else in there. It should just be these things. And actually, this is a really cool example of the sort of monstrosities that happen when you grow things in a culture. These holes that you're seeing on the valve face, here, here, and here, <laughs> they belong on the outside edge. They're the, the strutted processes that go around the outside of this diatom. And this one is just turned into a monster and it's created its strutted processes on the valve face. So normally, um, you know, if we think of these spines as being the position for where those things might normally be, um, it's putting its spines in like this position, like across the valve face, 
and in totally the wrong spots. It's completely misshapen. Um, it just basically, you know, this one was having a hard time putting its skeleton together the way that it was supposed to. And I don't think we want to take a picture of uh, Quasimodo here. Um, uh, circus freak diatoms are kind of interesting to find, but uh, but I don't, I don't think that um, we want to use them to characterize anything. This is just a girdle band, so it's the, the part that wraps around the outside there. Um, and I saw some other ones when we were looking around on Monday with Andy that had messed up valve faces where they had a bunch of strutted processes in the wrong place and I was like oh boy um, that's not what that's supposed to look like um, but you have to sort of know what things are, should look like in order to know what they shouldn't look like right so um, I don't know if this rim of Portula is any better than the last one gonna slow it down and see if I can see any more detail. You can just barely see there's a line in there, but um, it's a bit of imagination line, uh, in my opinion. You can't really see it um, cleanly, and I think if I changed the settings so it was on the finest magnification, we probably could. Um, but I'm not that excited about a line through a process. I know where it is, um, and I think Andy would know where it is if I sent him pictures. Again, internal view. Uh, this one, the room portal is here. The structure processes are all around the outside, <laughs> not on the valve face where they don't belong. Um, so I think the way that the culturing is typically done is everything is just one, uh, grown from one organism. So they isolate just a single cell and then, um, so everything we're looking at should have identical DNA, like absolutely identical DNA. Um, they should all be clones. So, um, but you know, the longer they're in the tank together, uh, uh, you know, that's when the weird stuff starts to happen, I think. So. Um, I don't know where they were collected from or why they were collected, so I don't have that information. Um, I mean, I don't know that it's necessary to relay it, but uh, here's an example of an external view. This one's got a little bit of junk over the surface, so you can't see most of the features very well. Um, but you can see, uh, so these are the little strutted processes. This is the way they look on the outside of the diatom. They're like little structures standing up off of the edge, right on the corner um, at the mantle and valve face uh, shoulder or junction. And then this is the external expression of the Rumba Portula. It's like a long trumpet shaped thing sticking up off of the valve face. And usually if you see that and there's just one of them, you just go, oh, that's the Lassia Syrah because that's the way that their Rumaportula typically look in scanning electron microscope. They just have like one long weird tube coming up off of their, uh, their valve face. And uh, then, then you know, there you go, we got it, the Lassia Syrah. Um, some cool news about the Lassia Syrah for me is that uh, a couple of days ago, I, I actually bought a um, some of the merchandise that is like diatom merchandise. And I think I bought a t-shirt with the Lassia Syrah. I don't remember which one I, it has on it, but one of my designs, basically, um, I hadn't bought any of my own t-shirts. Uh, but I thought, oh, it's time. I should probably have some of my own merch. Um, not that I'm trying to sell it, just it's cool stuff and I like it, so um, uh, I think I'm going to have one with the Glassy Sarah on it, but 
Um, if you are interested in uh, buying a t-shirt or something, stickers, whatever, uh, I'm not trying to push that on you, but you can, I should be able to get that right there at the Redbubble site. And uh, the Lassie Syrah is one of the cool drawings that I did that it's on there. There's a lot of dead space on the slides. Um, here's another vowel view from the outside. And this is sort of more what I was hoping to see um, because the surface structure and texture is present on this one. Um, it's slightly dissolved though, but there's the room of Portula. Here's all the strutted processes around the outside. And then we can kind of zoom in and look at the, um, this is the central photo Portula. And I think if I want to get any closer, because we're down to kind of one micron zone, I would have to go to a five or a six on the um, beam intensity, which would um, increase the resolution a little bit. But I think what I'm going to do is just zoom in, try to get the focus as clean as I can, which I think is right about there, and then zoom out a bit. Oh, uh, I know what I can do. One more thing I can do, which is get us a little closer. Um, I just moved the stage up a little bit because um, when you start looking at really small stuff you kind of need to be like really close to it if you think of the way that a magnifying glass works um, it should be kind of obvious to you that the closer you get sometimes the better off you are when you're looking at stuff in a magnifying glass and the same thing is sort of true with a, um, a microscope you want to be able to get nice and close to things and it should improve our resolution just a little. Okay. And then I'm going to change our speed settings uh, and fix the brightness and contrast. we can take a picture and then meanwhile I can come back and see what chat's been talking about. Michael Learning, hello. Um, if you're not following Michael Learning, there's another great person that you could uh, invest some of your uh, Twitch time into. Uh, Michael Learning obviously based on the name studies uh, mushrooms. Um, what's in the SCM right now? We're looking at some cultured material. Uh, these uh, strange little beasts that were captured by Andy Alverson's lab and then isolated and then because diatoms can clone themselves they just put them in these tanks where they have um, all the nutrients they could ever want and they just go like be yourself make clones and they do and then the clones over time turn into sort of um, circus freaks so <laughs> Neat, neat Nation dad hat. Might be fun. Um, uh, table Sick Maniac, hello. Um, uh, welcome in, everybody. We're having just a nice, casual Wednesday afternoon from the SEM stream. Um, and I think that image is going to be okay. So we can at least see the, the structure. It's a little uh, dissolved or maybe overgrown with silica. One or the other. Uh, or some combination so less than perfect but um, but that sometimes happens uh, just with diatoms they don't make their skeletons very strong um, not getting the exposure to natural environments so did that somehow not change to gold I don't know why those aren't working here we go I'll fix it for you uh, stupid stream deck uh, is there any other that I missed no okay if for some reason they're not they don't seem to be um, functioning correctly and I'm not sure if it's because of the um, I didn't change my code and it is plugged in oops um, 
so I'm not totally sure why it's not functioning correctly. But oh, I did pull out the uh, Tardy B. On my side, it works fine. For some reason, the chat stuff isn't working, or the links to the. See if I can figure it out. Oh, this is interesting. That's why. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe that's why I wasn't doing it. It's doing something where it wasn't listening. Let's see if it works. Aha, it's working now. Apologies for your channel points. I'll put it back to gold for you. There you go. Something that happened. OBS. What can I say? It should all be working now. Something came unlinked when OBS updated. So this is just the surface, external surface of the valve face of a diatom. Not a particularly great one, but um, I guess we can't be too judgy. Let's look around for a little bit more on this stub. Um, it might be helpful if I could find a girdle view, like a full girdle view of um, the specimen. I think that's the only view that's really missing. There's another valve view. This one's a little less, uh, a little less messed up. I'm just gonna play with the focus a little bit to see if I can make it perfect. as perfect as I can, which might be that, and then a little framing, we'll change the speed, and it should be ready to collect. Put that right there. I can come back. See how chat is coming along. Should be a pretty one. Um, 
And then we'll move over to the next sample. And um, I have a lot of images from, um, from all of these that I took very quickly on Monday, but I'll try to get some additional ones um, from each of the samples, except for the one that's not working very well. And then we'll, um, we'll also look at some diatomite. So I put some samples in here from um, these uh, 10 million year old diatomites that I've been looking at um, from Lake Idaho. Uh, it's been maybe like a year since we've looked at any of those diatomites, but um, I obviously could always spend a bit more time looking at um, any of those samples just to sort of see what's going on in them. Um, is it normal to see mutated diatoms in a natural collection too, or if largely, or does it only largely occur commonly in the cultured ones? Um, and do we know what the likely cause is? So um, that's a good question. Um, you can some, sometimes see mutated diatoms in natural uh, environments. Oftentimes they're associated with um, um, heavy metals in the environment. And so um, if you have some sort of toxic water conditions or heavy metal pollution or um, some sort of weird environmental, uh, environmental conditions that are like that, you may see um, what are called teratological deformations, um, or what we sometimes just, like I just call them circus freaks, um, because they're not building their skeleton correctly. And you can see even this one's got some uh, errors in the way that it's um, building things. So these are, there's two brimoportulas stacked on top of each other here. And the, I'm sorry, uh, photoportulas stacked on top of each other here. And then uh, the mantle photoportula is also a little, rimoportula is also uh, messed up. Um, but uh, those sorts of weird deformations are usually associated with bad things in the environment. Um, but it's hard to say for sure if it's always something bad. So we're going to hop over to one of the other samples now. And it's this one. Um, and we'll see if we can find some of these weird beasties as well. And the brightness and contrast are always all over the place from one stub to the next, so um, some adjustments need to be made as a result. Um, I think what we're looking for this in this sample was a little cycloteloid. Um, I posted a picture of one of them. What is that? I posted a picture of one of them in uh, on the Twitter, so that if you look, click on the about link down at the bottom of the screen, you'll probably see one of these weird creatures. Um, and I wanted to get some other um, valve face views and internal views. I did collect some images of those on Monday, but um, just one, and I don't know how deformed it was. So um, this is a, uh, a girdle view of one of those little beasties. And it's overexposed, so give me a second. The instrument's having a hard time with uh, light exposure today. Not sure why. Um, it's kind of jumping all over the place. Some things are kind of glowing, basically, is what that's saying. Um, which happens when they're either not fully attached. Um, so this particle may be like um, up, there may be something underneath it that's causing it to do that. Um, or just the change in the height, basically, from one sample to the next. 
Yeah. Well, this one's messed up anyway, but you can see uh, <laughs> this is a pretty messed up view. Um, you can't see the diatoms valve faces and the girdle bands in this view. And I think if I'm here, I'll still be able to see what we're looking for, like this height. That's actually part of the challenge is trying to um, be far enough out that you can um, see most of this sample. Oh, that's like a weird stuff in a discus. Um, shouldn't be in there. I think this is the actual one that I imaged on the Twitter uh, view that we have, which is okay. I wanted to come down here and look at this, uh, just get a close up of one of the strutted processes zones. Because they're very strange. So on this diatom, uh, this is not a Thalassiosyra, it's probably a Cyclotella. Um, something in here, sorry. Uh, the Mantophotoporchula have openings, and then the openings are actually really bizarre shaped. Um, they have like uh, bifurcating spine-like structures coming off of them in every direction and that's pretty unusual um, also the valve face has these sort of weird well they're weird to me uh, like groove structures along the sides um, that seem unusual between uh, the these are you know uh, these ridges or whatever that are in indentations that are here are very weird okay I'll put it on seven beam six and then I'll just this looks okay I'll take a picture it's a very strange little beast it looks like a beast of the forest Oh, CosmoQuest, hello. Thank you for bringing your people in. Sorry I, uh, you know, when I'm off in uh, the SEM land, sometimes I can't hear anything. I was having some weird echoing issue earlier as well, so I turned off the sound, and I haven't plugged in my headphones, so I can't hear any of the raid noises. Um, <laughs> uh, the overexposed image looks like the kind of image mask I draw when a photo heading. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, hello on the diagonal and broken symmetry. Thank you guys for coming in. Um, yeah, I think it's the exact same specimen, which is a good one, but I wanted to get a close-up view of it. And uh, on Monday when I was imaging them, I was just kind of zooming around. And then this is the last image I collected before I left was this uh, crazy looking thing and then uh, I just wanted to get home. So um, today's a uh, unusual day for me because I drove my car in, and I think it's pretty s solid uh, thunderstorm that's supposed to be going on uh, later today. And um, I I will usually ride my my new e-bike basically all the time. Uh, I've only ever not ridden it when the uh, there's a pretty bad rain occurring or lightning, because um, I feel like those are bad combinations. When I, I did my master's in New Mexico, and um, when I was there, uh, there was a uh, maybe a professor? Somebody uh, told me that someone had been somebody from the university had been struck by lightning and um, walking walking on their way to the, to the university 
and I was like, yikes. Uh, there's no trees or anything in New Mexico, you know, like in the central part of New Mexico, the trees are all tiny little things. And um, so if you're walking around, you're probably the tallest thing on the landscape sometimes and a little bit easier to get struck by lightning in that setting. Um, but it's made me very like focused on not being out in the lightning if there's not really tall things around me and um, I sometimes go out and take photographs of lightning um, if it's not raining and it's lightning then it, it's a little more appealing to me to go out and stand in it and try to get cool photos um, but I just want to get a nice close-up of this which we accomplished already so off to a good start this is uh, I believe. Yeah. Um, a nice close up. You can see a bit of the girdle band. This is all the mantle, and then these are these weird uh, mantle photoportula structures. Um, if you just came in with the raid, hello, we we're looking at diatoms from culture. And um, the cultures were grown in a lab, and sometimes. Uh, things that are grown in the lab have weird mutations and so we're seeing some of those see it's got this weird indentations or like big long grooves on the outside it's very strange to me um, this one just has spines on the face though it still does have mantle photoportula holes with like weird stuff coming out of them but it also has these spines that are sticking up off of the face um, one thing that's super weird about these guys is they seem to be um, creating long uh, girdle band rich bodies I think this is the one that we imaged I think I also got this one already this has these weird structures these are very weird structures on the outside. It's like ridges um, on the inside. And on the outside, there's like indentations associated with them. I don't know. Um, so they're making these very long cells that are... Oh, that one you can see the valve face on a little bit what I want is the valve face that's like a quarter turn shot again and you can see a little bit of the topography of it so that's nice and we can also get a nice close-up of these crazy spine structures very cool all right we're gonna slow that down and I just want to make sure that yeah, these are gonna turn out as okay Focus wise, these are the Mantha Photoportula, and here's on the other side the Mantha Photoportula. You see what's missing? It doesn't have a big room of portula like things sticking off of the face. And then some of these structures are kind of interesting ridges. Okay, uh, let's give it a shot. Just go ahead and collect that. So they're making these like super long sausage shaped diatoms, which are pretty weird. So your Minecraft is uh, being theme appropriate. You're AFKing near some farms at the moment and there's a thunderstorm happening in the game. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, Geeky Scopy, 20 plus people out here for diatoms. Uh, geek o -scopy. yes. Uh, this is a small audience, actually. Sometimes we have way more than that um, for diatoms. But the... Uh, almost 30 now, right? 27 people on channel. Um, I think that they are mostly here for the spectacular imagery that comes from the scanning electron microscope. And I am secretly tricking them into learning about diatoms in the process. 
but um, pretty cool and um, regularly get these sort of numbers I guess um, <laughs> don't get struck by lightning save the electrons for the microscope good idea uh, the diatom fandom is real there are some real diatom fans here in the channel uh, Cyanophyte is uh, is a diatom fan I believe a secret diatom fan um, who also is planning to stream from the microscope and uh, pretty normal Does your SEM, is that detect, probably detect secondary electrons? We're looking at secondary electrons right now, maybe corn. So um, the, the electron beam comes from, yeah, I can tell. I, I could tell it was like an autocorrect. The electron beam comes from uh, the gun. It hits the sample. And then the secondary electrons are the ones that actually give us topography. So, um, uh, somewhere I used to have pictures of those things just built in. I don't know what I did with them. Also, um, If you're not following the Midney Corn, you should give her a follow as well. Um, she's mostly been doing stuff with leather working recently, but she's also a scientist and uh, streams here on Twitch. Sometimes science, I think. Um, the secondary electrons are the ones that uh, are giving us the topography of our image. So the um, the secondary electron detector. Um, that's, you know, that's the electron fires down electrons, they hit the sample, it knocks electrons out of the specimen, whatever's under the beam, and then um, the secondary electron detector is the one, it's basically like an eye, um, it just detects the um, volume of electrons that hit it as a photoreceptor on there that um, turns the electron, has a positive charge, so electrons are pulled towards it. Um, and then it captures how many hit them, and that gives us the brightness of every pixel, basically. And then um, this uh, scanning electron microscope also has a backscatter detector, which may be what you were trying to ask me about, um, which would be the, um, uh, the electrons that go a little bit deeper into the sample and interact with the specimen and then can't make themselves come as far off of the surface that the secondary detector would detect them, they're captured by a much closer sensor called the second, the um, backscatter detector. And backscatter detectors can tell you something about the density of the materials that you're looking at. Um, and so if you wanted to look at two different metals, for example, um, the backscatter would let you tell that this one is iron and this one is nickel, or this one is tin and this one is nickel, or whatever. Um, because the differences in the density would be very apparent. Um, and then it also has an EDAX, an elemental uh, analyzer on it as well. So if we were wondering, like, what's the elemental composition of um, any particular specimen that we have on there, um, uh, what it does is it when the electrons get knocked out, so the electron beam is fired down on the specimen, and um, if you remember your model of what an atom looks like, there's these sort of shells of electrons that are around the nucleus, and some of the beam will knock electrons out that become secondary electrons, and some of them will be backscattered electrons, and when that happens, um, if it knocks it out from one of the lower shells, like an S shell or something, then um, it takes an electron from the shell above and it moves them down into, um, into the lower state shell. And when it does that, it releases energy. 
and um, because it goes from something that requires more energy to something that requires less energy. And what it does is it gives off that energy in the form of characteristic x-rays. And the characteristic x-rays are then captured by the elemental analyzer. And it can give you some idea of what the elemental composition of the sample is. Um, of course, it's meaningless for us because we're looking at stuff that's silicon dioxide and all of it is silicon dioxide. So it's going to tell us that our samples have silica, oxygen, gold, which I covered the samples in, um, in, in order to make them conductive, and then uh, aluminum, which is basically what the stub is made out of. Um, so the elemental composition would not be very interesting for these samples, and or any samples that I usually would look at for my research. So um, I hardly ever use the elemental analyzer, but there are people here who are geologists who might look at minerals or um, uh, they're trying to figure out like what the elemental composition of something is and this instrument can do that. Um, so for example, if we're looking for lead in the environment or um, one, of my, uh, one of the students who I'm on the committee for is looking at like um, bio, accumulation of heavy metals, um, it might be useful for that, for example. So. Um, somewhere I have little uh, tools that show the different interactions and, um, and basically what they produce uh, with respect to where they're hitting electrons and that sort of thing, but also you could probably just grab something off of Wikipedia that shows that. I feel like we got some good external views of this thing, and I just want to get like one more internal view, but our stage is uh, pretty barren of stuff. So there's a lot of like crawling around on the, this little stub looking for rare organisms. It's another little sausage. This is the girdle view. I don't think the bottom valve is present. I think it just goes like top valve and then girdle, girdle, girdle. Take a look at it in slow, and we'll just capture this one and get enough of them. Um, let's see. I've seen them under regular microscopes in undergrad and sadly never used an SEM. Well, Geeky, um, I'm bringing you your SEM view of them here, um, but I would say that uh, it's sort of a different world looking at diatoms in the SEM. There's a lot more detail. And I was talking earlier before you arrived a little bit about um, the light microscope is effectively looking at diatoms as though you're x-raying them because the light passes through them and you just see the interference with the diatom skeleton, you know, in the form of light and dark space. Um, and in the scanning electron microscope, you're actually seeing the surface. And um, there are microscopes that function that way where you would look at a reflected light, um, usually for, um, for like high powered light microscopes that have those, they have something called a Smith reflector, which is basically like a mirror. And 
um, the light housing is on the top and the mirror basically um, lets the light basically be fired down onto the specimen and then um, the path is then off of the sample and back up into your eyes so that you can see some of the surface structure but it still doesn't look quite like an SEM. Um, I didn't know if it was the vector info or the initial electron combined with the reflected electron that gives the topography. It's just the secondary electrons that give you topography. So um, the only thing it's doing is basically like lights, sort of like light would reflect to your eye. It's doing the same thing. It's just capturing electrons that are coming off of the material. And, um, you know, if you had a surface and you were pointing it towards your face, like right now, if I get the light just right, it's coming off at a perfect angle that this whole surface is very bright um, because it's pointed directly at the camera. And um, if you tilt it just a little bit, Right? It gets darker, and then you can see more of the actual structure because now the light's only hitting the top part rather than hitting the whole, the whole face. And so um, this structure's light and dark features that you can see, like the depression in the middle of the valve or the little ridges that are present when I tilt it, that's what the SEM is doing, basically. The light, in this case, would be electrons that are hitting it, and... Um, when things are pointed away from the camera, the light, some of the light is, you know, reflected in the wrong direction, so it's darker. And in the SEM, the same thing happens with the electrons. They come in, right, and it hits a surface, and then um, comes out of that surface. And if the surface is pointed towards the sensor, then it's bright, and if it's pointed away from it, it's dark. So it's just using the number of electrons that are coming in, the density of them, basically, and it captures those. So, um, I'll get to your second, your question in a second, uh, Sanofite. This, uh, Juggling of things that are on a microscope with answering questions is always a bit of a challenge. So it's another girdle view. If I start to zoom out too far, everything becomes impossible to see. But you can see this one isn't as clean as that one that we had from the, um, from the Twitter view. Here's another one up here. They all look like little tiny sausages. can see girdle view, um, the valve face, and then this one's valve face has been pushed into the girdle. So the girdles are wrapped around the outside. And sometimes that happens when they replicate um, and the girdle bands would have wrapped around um, two valves in the center that then became separated. Okay, well, let's move around. Um, but I do think that one of the things that's nice about the scanning electron microscope and diatoms in it is that you can get to sort of see their characteristic structures and features. And um, while I think they are visually appealing in a light microscope, I think that's much, much more appealing. They're more charismatic, basically, for most of them in the scanning electron microscope because you can see all these sort of spectacular detail that's present at this very, very small scale, right? We're looking at things that are typically, you know, we're looking at them at 20, 30,000 times magnification. And um, the detail of some of the structures that you can see at that magnification is kind of crazy um, with the scanning electron microscope. So I think that's, you know, Part of the appeal, probably, for people, um, and definitely, I sometimes just see diatoms, and I think they look stunning. You know, even having seen a lot of diatoms in the scanning electron microscope in the last ten years, uh, still 
still see some stuff that I think is pretty spectacular. I don't know that we'll find an internal view of this weird little cyclotella that's any better than the one that I already have. Just thought I'd come give it one little try and see how things went. Um, and see if we could find anything, but mostly I'm finding junk. Um, so I may make some more slides of these to scope out what's going on with that other sample. I may make some of these while I do that and see if I can get some higher concentrations. Um, normally when we prep them, we put a little bit of water on the stub and then we add the material um, from the original uh, samples. Look at this crazy tube it's made. Look how long that is. It's ridiculous. Um, just keep adding girdle bands. Uh, and so, you know, like I said, sometimes we, we just use a little bit of water to sort of reduce the total number of diatoms that are, are going to be on a stub. But for these, I think we actually just put them straight in, like straight concentration from the way that we had them. And it still is not very, uh, dense. So, okay, let's go look at some other things while we're here and we're on the SEM, and I got a little bit of time, we'll look at some um, fossil material. So a little, uh, a little more random. This has got some uh, ash mixed in with it. So just to warn you, not everything you're seeing on here is a diatom anymore because these were collected from outcrops. And these are really ancient diatoms. The ones that we're looking at here are 10 million years old. Um, because they're collected from intervals where there was volcanic ash, they actually can have pretty good preservation. This is the valve face of an Olicosyra like diatom. Um, let me fix the brightness and contrast, though. Um, and we can look around a bit. So here's an internal view of something, some more Olicosyra-like things. Um, dominant organisms that we found in this environment were Olicosyra-like organisms. Um, but that is some sort of Cyclotella or Stephanodiscus. So there are some centric diatoms that aren't Olicosyra present in our samples. Oh, uh, this is the stub that I can't screw all the way in, so it keeps turning when I try to uh, zoom in on something. So I need to get close first and then zoom in. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Well, this is a cool little, it's a Stephanodiscus like thing. It's very similar to this one that we're we're looking at right here. So for this one has like a really dense center ring without any areoli in it, which is odd. I'm trying to move it as little as possible. To keep it from spinning. Um what a weird little guy. Uh this one just has spines, not strutted processes that you can see. The strutted processes are here. Um, they're actually below the spines in this group. So uh, there's, there's a hole associated with the rumoportula and the strutted process that's actually um, underlying the spines. And so unless the spine is broken off, you wouldn't be able to see it. Uh, it's also quite a bit bigger than the thing we were just looking at. This. We'll do this and a little bit of adjustment to the brightness. And while that's happening, I can see what's going on. Okay. Um, 
after you secure a day job. Okay. What happens if you scan living samples under the scanning left? Hey, gnome fire. Um, sorry, I didn't catch you till just now. Uh, another one of our friends, gnome fires, here in the channel. Uh, they do some music streams and uh, some travel streams, which are pretty cool. Uh, living samples in the SEM. Well, everything in the SEM is in a vacuum, so nothing really lives in those conditions for very long. If I were to put a living organism in there, uh, the vacuum would kill it. Also, most of the living things that we would put in would probably need to be coated with gold. So not only would they be exposed to a vacuum, but I probably would have had to put them in a vacuum, coat them with gold, and then stick them in another vacuum in order to make it so that they don't, um, so that they're conductive. And of course, the entire time things are under the beam, electrons are being blasted out of them. So I think that would be kind of cruel to put living organisms in there and have them basically attacked by tiny lasers that are ripping pieces of electrons out of their body. Um, and I think another thing that's really critical is, see how long it takes me to take a picture, right? So uh, if I'm scanning an image and it takes three minutes and I had something living in there, I wouldn't be able to image it very well. So all those things are problems that make it so that we can't usually use a um, a scanning electron microscope to look at something that is currently alive. Um, they do have some low vo vacuum uh, scanning electron microscopes, and this one actually has a setting where I can set it to be relatively low vacuum, a low vacuum mode. Um, but the problem is, um, even that's probably not going to be good enough for a living organism, which is going to be moving around and um, being very unhappy even in the low vacuum, so. Um, so we don't look at things that are alive in the SEM, and uh, I don't recommend it. Um, if you want to look at living stuff, usually you need to put it into a light microscope, um, or you could put it into some sort of epoxy. It wouldn't be able to move around. Um, and then look at it in it slices in a TEM, a transmission electron microscope. Um, still would be dead though at that point. You'll have to set your weapon to stun to prevent them from wriggling. Um, I wish I had a stun inside there to keep things from wriggling, but I just have electrons inside the chamber and so I can only zap things and uh, destroy them slowly, unfortunately. This diatom, unlike the other one that we looked at, we looked at one that belonged to the genus Cyclotella, or I think it did. Um, uh, this is not a Cyclotella that we're looking at, but the one that we were looking at before was kind of a type of Cyclotella. Um, and then uh, the one that we're looking at right here is kind of a Stephanodiscus. Which is this genus, if I typed it correctly. I did. I, except for I gave Stefan Discus a shout out instead of doing what I was supposed to do. Uh, that's the Stefan Discus. Usually they have characteristic mantiphotoportula that subtends each one of the spines and spines on costi on the outside, which are distinct. The valve face is divided up into sort of pie wedge shaped um, fascicle and interfascicle areas. And um, this one has a really interesting central area that's sort of got a wide annular like band around the middle of it um, that is distinct and separates the central part of the valve face from the rest of it. Um, internally, if we saw an internal view of this, there should be at least one rim of portula. Hey, Studio Cornix! Um, these samples are from Lake Iowa, um, which is not a real lake anymore, but an uh, ancient lake. And it's in Idaho and Washington. And uh, it used to span basically a large part, several states across the western part of the U.S. And um, 
So very ancient, 10 million year old lake deposits with no lake there anymore. Um, and they were collected from outcrop by the Idaho Geological Survey. And they sent them to me and asked me to image them. So they're from the Rocky Mountains. And um, I've looked at some of the material from these and described a new genus from this material. Uh, not this particular sample, but from these uh, with my friend Andy, who uh, is the one who sent me the um, culture material that we were looking at before you arrived. Um, so these are things that were collected as uh, essentially rocks in the field that we just scraped into little pieces, broke them up, and uh, and sprinkled them onto uh, a sample to let them dry on a stub. And then here we are looking at them in this kind of electron microscope. Uh, but if you wanted to look at something like this kind of material, you could just go to your local hardware store and buy some diatomaceous earth and crush it up a little and sprinkle it into a microscope. And this is the kind of thing that you would probably see in that. Most diatomaceous earth that you find in the US, I think comes from either this site or similar sites um, in terms of age. They're mostly um, Miocene or Pliocene in age. Um, from around the U.S. where we just have, you know, extra diatomite laying around. And um, it's used for all kinds of things, as we've talked about on this channel before. Um, I think this is the same stuff. I've almost convinced myself of that already. So this is an internal view of, I think, the same diatom we were just looking at. Um, and some of these materials were originally going to uh, be analyzed by a grad student in my lab and then uh, they left at the beginning of the fall semester last year they were not happy with grad school at all which sometimes happens and uh, so the project didn't get worked on but nobody was giving us money for it anyway, so it's okay. Um, this is an internal view of that stuff in a discus, and this is the cribra, which covers over the areoli. The little holes that you see on the outside have a domed cribra on the inside, which is another characteristic of stuff in a discus. Um, and I'm just trying to get it, I'm fussing with the focus to get perfect because it's what I do, I guess. Um, when I can see the Cribra, I usually am very happy with my image quality in terms of the focus. Um, it's a good sign. It means that the image is going to turn out to be nice and clean. The sample might not be clean, but the image will be nice and clean, and then we'll be able to see a lot of detail. So I'm just zooming out a little bit. And I'm just going to nudge it down. Give it a, another little nudge. So it doesn't want to come down completely from the top. Good. And then I'm going to change the speed. And I think the beam intensity is in a good place. We should be able to see a lot of the detail. Um, these little bumps are the mantle photoportula, which we've seen in all the centric diatoms we've been looking at. And then uh, the rumoportula, I think, is this thing down here. There's a little bit of clay on the surface of this. Um, but you can still see the um, 
the areoli. And then some stuff in a discus have valve face uh, photoportula as well as mantle photoportula, and I think that's what this and maybe that is. You can see the radiating spokes here where there's slightly lighter colored bands. And those are the, the costi or the ribs that are on the outside as ridges. Um, and then these would be depressions on the outside. Hey, Pacific Plankton, how are you doing? Long time no see. Oh uh, yeah, it's a diatomite site, yeah. <laughs> Apparently gorillas were splitting off from the ancestors of human chips in Monday, but not in North America. <laughs> Actually didn't see what the daily diatom turned out to be, and I didn't check it today to make sure it was working, so hopefully uh, it didn't steal points from you, but I'll take a look. Oh, it's a uh, meridian. Um, that's meridian anceps, I think. We'll wait and see if I got it right. Oh, oh, perfect. That's our daily diatom. Meridian anceps, anceps. Um, you've been running around. You're heading to your track meet. I feel like maybe that's backwards. You're supposed to. Uh, get to the track meet and then run around. Yeah, we're in North America. Um, I have some uh, samples that I'm supposed to be working on with my friend Nicole where we're going to collect, um, potentially collect some stuff from uh, You'll Go Visit. Um, I can't reveal the name of the exact site for this. Uh, I don't know if it's on private property either. But the Idaho Geological Survey um, sent me these materials, and they did give me the coordinates. So outside of stream, I'll look them up and send them to you if you want to collect some materials, um, if you can get onto the property to do so. so but I don't want to just send it out through the internet here. So... Thank you for the follow, Dynium. Dynium. Uh, you're willing to trespass. Well, I don't want you to get shot over some uh, diatomite, for sure. But they collected a whole bunch of stuff across Idaho. So, um, you know, I can give you a few really key locations that might be kind of cool. And then. You know, if you want to go get yourself shot over it, you can, I guess. Just tell them that you work for the Idaho Geological Survey and you sent out to get some more samples of diatoms and see what they say. It can't go wrong, right? <laughs> what could go wrong? Internal. Uh, so that's Steph. An internal view of a stuff in a discus. There's a lot of other stuff in here. Um, and I think this is a Symbella, a Simba Plura. Oh, stupid. Oh, here it is. I'll have to wait until it's moved and then zoom in like a patient person would uh, I think this is a symbol plura I oh, just want to see if it has crazy uh, areoli or what's going on with the pores oh, I can't really see them oh there's slits they're just lineolations that's not very exciting. Uh, this is a diatom, obviously. This is a raphid diatom, so it doesn't have many of the structures of the things that we've been talking about. 
And just for reference, all this stuff that we're looking at is volcanic ash. All these chunks of things that aren't diatoms are all, they're all what tephra looks like in the scanning electron microscope. Um, it's diatoms and tephra, and that's what we're seeing here. So everything that you're seeing is <laughs> one of those two things right now. Um, and the guys that collected this stuff were like, uh, convinced that it was all just pure diatomite. And I was like, it's mostly tephra. Like most of the stuff that you sent me is just volcanic ash. It's sometimes difficult to tell what you're looking at in hand sample um, between the two. Ooh, it's a sort of weird cyclotelloid. Uh, the Pliocene cyclotelloids have these undulated vowel faces like this one does. Similar to the cyclotello that we were looking at earlier, but not quite right. Um, and these probably need to be moved into their own genus eventually. And I don't know if I'm the person to do it, but it's on our list of things to do, is to explore these a little bit better and see what we can do about um, these cycloteloids, the, this group in particular. Okay, let's jump this to seven. We can see the structure a little bit better in here. And then out to the whole field of view. So it's egg-shaped, which is unusual for most cyclotella. They're usually more or less perfectly circular. And then um, it has this undulation on the vowel face that's very distinct. And almost always when it has a transverse undulation like this, there's a rim of portula on one end of the vowel right either here or there. So I'm hoping that's the case with the one that we have here as well. Uh, okay, let's just see what we get. Um, patients are overrated. Uh, what is diatomite used for? It's a good question, cyanophyte. Um, people use diatomite for a lot of different things. Probably the thing that most diatomists want to tell you, like the first thing out of their mouth, if you ask a diatomist, like what do they use diatomite for, is usually gonna be, it's a filter it's, uh, you know, it's a bunch of little lacy structures. And so people use it to filter things like beer and wine. And that's usually when people, uh, that's usually the end of the diatomist's interest in what else people might use diatomite for. Um, so it's used as a filter. For sure it's used to filter things like beer and wine. Um, it's also used for pool filters. So like a swimming pool filter, all fun things. Um, and then, uh, it also is used for, um, um, like hand warmers, you know, they put this sort of, uh, things in the winter time that you open and then you kind of rub your hands on them and they get warm. Um, those usually have diatomite in them. Anything that says like silica gel in it, it probably had diatomite in it that was modified. Um, for drying things out. Um, it's used for, uh, um, in the old days they used it for dynamite because the lacy structure basically would keep the glycerin from interacting with uh, itself and causing an explosion. So the way a typical stick of dynamite works is it's packed with diatomite and then glycerin is added in between that and then a fuse is stuck in there, right? And then what happens is the explosion causes the glycerin to react with each other. And in that case, the diatomite is used to stabilize the concoction to keep it from exploding. Um, and then the blasting cap and the, the fuse are basically used to reverse that process. The, um, 
the thing most people use diatomite for or diatomaceous earth, the, the two words are interchangeable. Like if you bought it at a hardware store uh, in the U.S., um, it would be used for um, sprinkling around your garden or around ant hills, um, usually to keep pests away from plants. So they'll sprinkle it around um, plants that they want to make sure that um, certain insects don't get close to the plant um, or slugs will sometimes uh, be deterred by it. So it's used as like a natural deterrent in environmental conditions um, where organisms have to cross its path. And the reason for that is that the diatomite has all of these um, Uh, shards of really sharp stuff and um, when ants crawl across it, it it can cut them it's small enough to actually cut them or um, or get stuck in all of their legs and, uh, and they have all these little hairs and spines and stuff attached to their bodies and so it's actually used as a deterrent to keep ants away um, from whatever that you know you might be wanting to block them from so people put it around their, um, you know, if you have an anthill on your sidewalks and you want to get rid of the anthill, people sometimes will sprinkle diatomite on that um, as, an, as an example. Or just around your garden, if you have a lot of slugs or a lot of undesirable insects, um, it's a common deterrent, basically. And people like it, I think, mostly because it doesn't have any chemicals, it's just the the diatomite, right? So it's just the mechanical process that's creating issues for insects or slugs. And so it's, you know, safe to put in your garden. Um, I've also heard that people will sometimes eat it. I don't know why. And people ask me sometimes about eating it, and I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea. There's nothing valuable in it. Your body doesn't need silica. Um... You know, it's not going to filter anything inside your body, so that doesn't create any value. Um, but I, so I don't recommend it. I don't think it'll harm you unless you eat large quantities of it. But it's like eating dirt. It's not. It's not necessarily going to help anything. Um, but people do it. So, and they sometimes ask me about it. That's all I know. This is another stuff in a discus, I believe. We're looking at a nice internal view of it, if I could get it to not be so bright and ugly. Yeah, there you go. You can see right into it. And then this is a... some sort of um, eraphid, pseudostar sarah maybe. Um, this is a stephanodiscus, and you can see all the strutted processes are here around the margin of the stephanodiscus on the outside, and then these spoke-like structures are uh, the interfascicles, and the fascicles are the pieces between them. So a lot of the same stuff we've already seen. That one's nice and clean, but it's also probably not going to image very well. Um, there's another stuff right here. I can get it to move to the center. This is a different species than the one that we looked at before. I'm pretty sure. Um, it has a different characteristic appearance. Um, it still has sort of a central Pump, but it doesn't have all of the huge ridges and we saw this like big ring around the middle um, and the one that we were looking at before it's not present here the spines also have a slightly different characteristic to them and um, the areoli are slightly different
there is really pretty these um, Mantafoto portulas, what I'm assuming those are, really distinct. They stick out really far. Here's another one that also wasn't in the previous one that we looked at. They're like little tiny volcanoes, right? Standing way up off the surface. Lilu says, I used to use diatomaceous earth on your chickens to combat mites. Yeah, exactly. So basically any kind of thing you can stick it on there. <laughs> You're going to harvest it and turn it into chalk? I suppose you could try. <laughs> can I eat it? I thought that was just some people asking about mushrooms. All No, yeah, sometimes people ask about diatomaceous earth. I guess they just want to eat everything. And then uh, I get a lot of people ask me, like, if I drink this in my water, will it make me you know, will it poison me or something, so, um, your circuit, <laughs> circuit boards need silica, I guess so, um, I guess you could use them for that, uh, thank you for the follow, death, death siphon xxx, and, uh, pd gamer, pd gamer, and, uh, sado pampers, sedompiters, Sado pompers. Sado pompers? Hey, Zaychap with a raid. Welcome in, Zaychap. How are you doing? You came in right while I was staring at the uh, list of things that had happened. <laughs> Hi. Let's, uh, we'll give like a who shout out for Zaychap. Zay, Zaychap, Zaychap, Zachap. I want to say it's Zach App. Is it Zach App? I don't know how to pronounce it. What's my who say? It says Zach. There you go. It's Zach Hap. Um, they're an Aussie. They do gardening and they do technical dialogue, history, facts about reality. They're here to help you and me. They're deeply optimistic yet brutally realistic. They explore depth. Uh, passionate expressor with an emphasis on meaning and honestly pushing for a novel potential to be free and they can't wait to get to know you it sounds like you should follow them that sounds like a super interesting about me that's a uh, nicely done Zach um, we're looking at some really tiny ancient diatoms from Lake Idaho formation in Idaho and uh, they're 10 million years old, and they look like they just came out of the oven yesterday. So, um, very cool, fresh, fresh baked diatoms, um, but that are 10 million years old, and uh, just some little beasties I hadn't looked at before. So I thought we would take a look at them in the light microscope. A bit earlier, we were looking at some uh, diatoms that had been collected from um, living cells and grown in cultures. So. Um, this is not that. This is the other part. And, uh, and we get to look at all these cool, cool diatoms. Um, and we were talking about diatomaceous earth a little bit, and what could you use diatomite for? So when you have uh, 10 million year old diatoms, and they are most of what's present in whatever you're looking at, usually we call that diatomite. Diatom it, right? Um, because we put it at the end of things that are um, rocks. That's that's usually like meteorite, right? It's like a type of rock made out of a meteor. Um, and diatomite is the same kind of word. It's like it's like a rock. Um, so these were collected in the outcrop as rocks, basically. We just scraped a little bit of them with an. I think we used like a. Um, like a needle-like thing to scrape some of them apart and then magic diatoms tiny tiny algae that normally in this case would have been living in an ancient lake and we have them living in well dead uh, in our samples 
They died in our samples. This is an epithemia. Epithemia are characterized by these costi that go across the entire vowel face. And they usually have a raphe that comes up onto the vowel face and um, it's like a slot-like structure that comes up onto the vowel face here into the middle. And I can see a hint of it. If I zoom in, which we can keep zooming in because we're in a crazy scanning electron microscope, um, you might be able to see a little bit of it. It's, I think it's right in here. But um, this is like an ancient relative or potentially just straight up uh, epithemia. It looks like it belongs to the adnata kind of type of uh, epithemia species group. And um, one of the things that's kind of cool about epithemia is that they normally have an endosymbiotic relationship with um, nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria. And I just said a lot of words, like, real quick together. And I'm going to break it down for you. So endo means internal, internal. Symbiotic, I think probably most people know what that means. That's two things living together. So endosymbiotic means uh, things that live internally, one of them living with the other one. So they have an endosymbiotic relationship. And what that means, that's the polite way of saying this diatom has um, imprisoned cyanobacteria inside its body to function and help it and then it provides the uh, the cyanobacteria with a home so it's like a prison for i guess it's a voluntary prison on some level just got smacked with stem words yeah um you have you, you have muted to avoid learning stuff good plan that's a good plan except for now i'm typing it into the chat uh, so you're still forced to learn things, Octum. Um, and the other word I said was uh, nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. And nitrogen, we all know what nitrogen is, right? Just a like elemental component, but it's used for all kinds of organisms. And what's different about nitrogen fixation is that um, you're breathing nitrogen right now. 80% of basically every breath you take is nitrogen gas. But your body can't do anything with it, and none of the plants can do anything with it really, and nobody can use it even though it's nitrogen. Um, it's completely inert in that form, and the only way that you could actually um, utilize it is through this process of nitrogen fixation, which takes the nitrogen gas and turns it into ammonium. And then once it's in a state that's ammonium, which is a reduced state, you can ask, add oxygen to it and it becomes uh, nitrite. And then you add some more oxygen to it and it becomes nitrate. And when it's a nitrate, things can actually use it like plants to grow. The problem is that no plants can actually get from nitrogen gas into nitrate without having something help them. And in this case, there's just a few organisms on planet Earth who've figured out this process of basically taking the gas and converting it into a nutrient that you could actually use. And for them, nitrogen is everywhere. For everything else on planet Earth, they have to wait for that thing to basically convert it in order to use it. And in this case, the epithemia have imprisoned something that knows how to do it because it doesn't know how to do it. And so it lets the um, cyanobacteria basically fixate the nitrogen for it from a gas. And there's gas everywhere in the water as well, dissolved in the water, and turn it into a nutrient for it right inside the house, right? right. Prison, hostel, nursing home, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's, it's contained it. So... Um, 
What that means is that Diatom no longer has to worry about acquiring nitrogen at all. And um, that's a huge power for the Diatom because it just takes some of the nitrogen that the cyanobacteria generates and uses it. And uh, I don't know what uh, why that really helps the cyanobacteria very much. Um, presumably, it doesn't have to fight to survive, and also the diatoms usually give them some other aspects of it, not just a home. Typically, they also give them some... Um, often, they give them some nutrients or something else that they need um, to help them do that. Um, one of the things that helps is that um, in order to get from nitrogen to uh, nitrate, it has to pass through ammonia, and ammonium is a reducing environment. And for a lot of the cyanobacteria, the way that they manage that is they put this mucilaginous sheath over the outside of their body, which makes them a reducing environment naturally because the oxygen can't get through it very well. And I think one of the reasons why they want that home is basically they don't have to exert energy to make a oxygen deficient environment that allows them to fixate nitrogen pretty easily. And so there's a value to it for them in that they are in a reducing environment inside the diatom basically. And um, it allows them to conserve some of their energy for other things rather than making this like mucilaginous sheath um, which can be problematic for them. So I suspect that's part of the reason, not just that they are giving them a home, but they are creating an environment that's helpful for them, that means that they don't have to utilize some of the energy that they are making to do something that they don't want to have to create. So I zoomed in on it, and it turned the stage just a little bit. I want to move it to the middle and then zoom in. I just wanted to see what this thing was. Oh, it's a little internal view of stuff, I think. So that's a long way of saying basically that probably this environment that they were captured, that these diatoms were living in, had low nitrogen. And as a result, we have this diatom that doesn't care about the fact that it has low nitrogen that can live there and do quite well because it has a passenger basically that will feed it food it sounds like a pretty good deal um you know but it's not part of the organism it's a separate organism and when they grow they have to acquire them or in the case of diatoms when they clone they probably split some of them between the two clones um so there's a custody battle that happens, you know, when the, the cell splits apart um, that would result in shared material between them having to be moved into. So hopefully there's enough of the endosymbiotic organism to basically be present in that environment. And that's probably another advantage of making your home a diatom, which is that uh, they can split and split and split and split many times without you having to be exposed to the outside world at all, right? So you can just hide inside that diatom. And as it splits and makes itself and regenerates itself, basically, um, you can just chill out in there, stay in your little environment, and um, stay safe. So this is another diatom. This is a diplonese. And my very good friend Itzi is a specialist of diplonese. This one's a little ratty, but I just wanted to see if we could see the... It's got like some clay on it. I wanted to see if we could see some of the structure, but I don't think we can because there's a little too much clay. All right, let's jump over to another sample. We'll spin the wheel, go around to sample five, and see what's in this one. This is some more diatomite. It's from the same kind of material, but a different site. And you can see it's all full of a bunch of little oligocyra. Um, that's these things here that are like little tiny beer can shapes. Um, here's a valve view of them. This is a girdle view of them. And these are pretty typical oligocyra for this time frame. 
terms of the shape. And then there's a little cycloteloid, which I hope to find. Something that's not covered with junk that looks like that would be good. That's probably the eternal quest of the person who's controlling the SEM is trying to find something that you're pretty sure must exist in your sample, but you need to basically search around until you can find it. And in my case, I have you guys along as company while we do it. So that's nice. And we can both look around. I guess I'm doing most of the looking seems how you don't have any controls but you're here with me so and that's nice nice to be able to share some work this is a uh, a giant something right here what is this we never know what we might find in fact most of the stuff that we're looking at probably doesn't have names by the way Here's another one of those cycloteloids. That's an uh, cochinese. I mean, they have genera, like they belong to a genus. Some of them don't belong to any genera either. Because um, <laughs> they're ancient, and people haven't necessarily looked closely for what these things are. And probably not very many people have looked at them in the scanning electron microscope, except for my de dedicated Twitch followers probably have seen some of the stuff before if you've been around for a long time in my stream uh, you'll have seen some of these ancient samples before because we have looked at them before uh, but like you might be some of the only people on planet earth who's ever even looked at any some of these materials which is kind of cool uh and, you know, I guess when I get uh, bored of researching things I need to research, I can probably just spend my twilight years digging through these samples, finding new things to describe. Because there's probably enough stuff in here that that could be the end of my career, just going through, finding things and describing them. Um, it's mostly not what I want to do, but, um, but I think it still would be kind of fun to characterize things. What is this? Oh, a girdle view. A girdle view of a uh, fragile area. Oh, what is this, though? Oh. Oh. It's a Gomphosphenia, maybe? That's a weird diatom. one that's just a little bit clearer than this. That's some sort of Gomphonema-like organism. I think maybe it's Gomphosphenia. Look how clean the vowel face is. Boy, that's a weird thing. Super strange. We're just looking at oddities today. It's part of what we do. Looking for the weird ones. So if I find something super strange and it's kind of neat uh, and I can find enough of them, we could probably take enough pictures I could describe it or send it to somebody and see if they know what it is. Uh, if it's not me, so. Ivan.pro, hello, welcome back. And Corkboard, hello. Uh, 
sorry, I was busy, like, lost in my thoughts, uh, SEM thoughts. Um, nutrient exchange, yeah. The ones that evolved into chloroplast, yeah. Um... Junk free and photogenic, that's what we're hoping for. Uh, cork board, cork, cork board. You should please give cork board a follow. They, uh, they stream onto Twitch to talk about science stuff and hardly anybody knows of them. So like if you're a hipster Twitch watcher and you like those small streams where you can be really intimately connected with um, another streamer and uh, and have great conversations with them, you should uh, give them a follow. I think you'd like it. Um, very chill. Very, very chill stream. Um, and then uh, Yvonne.pro as well. To give a shout out. They gave us a raid last time. Yvonne.pro hung out with me. And uh, here they are back for some SEM time. We're looking at stuff in the scanning electron microscope. I think when you rated me before, we were looking at stuff in the light microscope. And I might do some more light microscopy tonight. Or tomorrow, we'll see. Um, I got some uh, lectures I have to work on, but I don't want to do it. So maybe I'll do something else. Um, Twilight years. <laughs> Yes. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, hopefully there's more in here and we can find one and get a good clean view of the middle part of the valve. So. Um, don't lecture, don't teach. Well, I have to, it's part of my job. Um, and. If it wasn't the fact that it's not a class that I normally teach and I will never teach it again, then I probably wouldn't mind so much. But um, the fact that I don't want to teach it and it's not my topic and I probably will never teach it after this semester means that like it's a lot of work. Uh, Cenophyte, do I ever invite students to watch the stream? I sometimes have my students sit here and control the SEM while I just stand around and answer chat messages. Um, but like students from my class, almost never. Um, those are students that work in my lab that I usually do that with. Gomphosphenia. Um, at the beginning of the stream, there was a delay because I was trying to get OBS to work correctly, but also because our new administrative assistant came in here and she was very excited to hear about like what this machine did and she's like, oh, microscopes are super cool. She's like, it's, there's not even like a word, like it's even more cool than cool. And I was like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what to tell you. This is, you know, it's what I do. So obviously I think it's cool. Um, and then I sent her some information about the Twitch stream because she, <laughs> she follows stuff on Twitch. And I was like, well, you're gonna love it. Um, so, and I told her sometimes she wants to put something in here. Um, maybe we'll just have her come on to my, Twitch stream one day. Uh, unfortunately, we usually stream from the SEM while she's working, but uh, it would be really cool to have her here and just chill out and like look around at stuff on the stream and be on my Twitch channel. She might actually like that. So I'll see what she's into and then we'll make some decisions based on that. But um, I don't usually tell my students like come check out my channel or anything like that. Um, unless they're already in my lab and then they know who I am and know what I study. Um, I definitely don't like promote my stream at all. So um, there, there are a few students who know, you know that I'm here and that I'm doing it. Um, but uh, it's not like it's a secret. I just, I don't think they're interested in it generally. So uh, if somebody showed a bunch of interest, then I would be, oh, you should check out this stream I do. But I'm generally not trying to promote things unless people, unless I know they're interested in it. Um, 
you know, I, I don't want someone coming to the channel thinking that they could, like, I don't know, curry my favor by being around or whatever. I mean, if they weren't a student in my class, maybe that would be cool. But, um, the combination of, like, you know, hanging out with somebody who they're supposed to just be your professor, right? So, I don't want them, like, trying to get extra credit by buying a t-shirt from my website or something. I'm trying to keep everything, all the lines clean. So, if they're super interested in diatoms or microscopes or whatever, photography, I probably would have a conversation with them about it. But, um, generally I don't. So, they probably, they probably get enough of my, um, voice making them sleepy while I'm lecturing at them. Um, so unless they were hoping that I was going to lull them to sleep here as well, I don't know why they would want to watch it. If they're, if they need something to help put them to sleep, you know, sure. <laughs> I have so many students that I watch like while I'm lecturing and I, I'm not, um, I feel like the lectures are actually pretty uh, active. It's not like I'm just droning in quiet voice the whole time. Uh, I feel like I'm actually like kind of engaging and uh, they're like, like, you know, falling over in their chairs sleeping and I find that hilarious. Uh, it's funny to watch. This is a little tiny diatom. It's like a tiny stuff like thing. Hmm. Uh, I don't know that I need to take a picture of it though. All right, let's jump over to the last stub that I have prepared, which is number six. And then I'll see what, I don't remember what's on this one either. Uh, probably a bunch of diatoms from diatomites and some volcanic ash. <laughs> if it's like all the other ones. And we'll get some pictures and chat a little bit more. And then I'm going to go home. Maybe I'll do a microscope stream at home. You never know. Uh, the streams from home uh, are a question mark. But I do need to actually take the microscope back home because I brought it in for the inventory today. So, um, so there's that. I'll at least have the microscope back in our house again. Ooh, that's a that's one of the cycloteloids. That's a funky view. All right, let's see if I can get it in focus so it doesn't look so terrible. It's got like a row of spines around the inside. It's a weird place for spines, like a ring of them. Uh, it's a cycloteloid, so it has, it's not, probably not a cyclotella, but a cycloteloid. It's closer to cyclotella than anything else. All right, let's try to find one that's not covered with junk and get a nice clean view with a nice clean shot of it. That one has junk. See, somewhat elliptical in shape instead of being circular. And then it has this transverse undulation on the valve face. Um, sometimes those things are a little rounder when they're small and they become elliptical the older they get or younger they get, depending on how you're looking at it. Uh, the smaller that they get, they're more round. Uh, ooh, that's just a, a nice long chain of Olicocyra. Um, I didn't mention what Ivan.pro does, but they are like a coder kind of a person. And uh, they coded uh, chicken coop things. And they said something about maybe trying to code 
uh, a microscope feed so that the uh, mustache would stay on things that were moving or the googly eyes would stay on things that are moving. I don't know how serious you were about that uh, idea, Ivar, but it sounds kind of like a fun one. It's maybe just a navicula. That's what it looks like. There's some really big one right there. That's a huge version of a cycloteloid. Asymmetric shape. It's a little dissolved. Not the best quality. What is this? It's a triangular diatom. Aww. It's a fragilarioid of some type, I think. Um, these are super uncommon. Uh, I find them sometimes in lake sediments. Yeah, I think it's some sort of fragilaria. You almost never see them a triangular shaped like this. Uh, the species is, I don't remember the name of the species in Fragilaria today that are like this, but this is a 10 million year old sample, so it's probably not the right name anyway. We'll take a picture. It's been a while since I took a picture of anything. At least like 20 minutes of digging around in the sample. Corkboard, thank you for the gift subscription to, um, to Evan or Evan. It's gonna happen, but I gotta figure out how exactly you wanna do it. And you're moving on Friday, so it'll be a little while before you have something for me to try. Oh, that sounds really cool. Um, let's see, uh, this is, I missed a bunch. I'm gonna scroll backwards. Uh, let's see, I hope to find you soon. Oh, cool, there you go. Uh, Low motivation, exactly. <laughs> um, or that it's a class requirement. Yeah, I don't want that either, right? No blurry lines. This is good policy. Yeah, it's my policy. So uh, things can get messy when you've got some students trying to redeem extra credit with channel points. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I could put that in. I think that actually would be a fun channel point reward, uh, extra credit in my class. Um, not gonna lie, you're often streaming in my chill down time before bed. Hey, it's fine. Uh, I don't, you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> Talk more about nitrogen fixation and you'll be comatose. <laughs> um, do I take the SEM home? No, I, the SEM does, stays here. Uh, the light microscope goes home with me. One of them, one of three does. So you need to jam out and get your walk in before the storm. Okay, good luck. Uh, thanks, and I'll see you later, studio. If I'm on tonight uh, and I can lead into something that you're streaming, maybe I'll try to do that. Um, if not, maybe I'll just try to stream. Lightning storms might happen, and I might stream lightning too, so that's an option. Um, you've been thinking about that all day. Okay, cool. Uh, Cat Dove, thank you for the follow. Um, and uh, now you've got all the cool emotes, uh, Evan. You can you can spam your attack um, on people's channels with all the cool diatom emotes. Um, so there's that. That's good. Um, Super Poss also. Thank you for the follow and could do anything. Thank you for the follow and Radio Yerevan. Thank you for the follow and Bounce House Forty Two. Thank you for the follow. I think most of those people must have come in with Zach. So um, thanks for all the follows. I've had a good day with follows today. You know we're four follows away from 2,700 follows, um, which is a good round number, but I'm not really into numerology. So um, very cool. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Who were you trying to forward it to? Um, 
Yeah, yeah, I see. Could do anything. You definitely came in with Zach. You got some of Zach's emotes there. Thank you for the follow. It's always good behavior. Uh, you know, you don't need to, but I feel like if you follow somebody into a channel for a raid, uh, triangle diatom. I don't know what the thing's called. I'm just calling it triangle diatom. That's where we are, folks. I have no idea what that thing is. I think it's a fragile area. But uh, when you start looking at stuff that's this old, you know, anything goes. This is how I, I just, browsing around in samples like this that are ancient is how I ended up describing a new genus. So uh, it happens. You just browse around and you see something and you're like, what is this? <laughs> what? What is happening? Um, and that happens more often than I'd like to admit in the, uh, in the really ancient samples that are here. You just see things that are like, that's not the way we have. We don't have anything like some of these things today. Um, they're extinct. So 10 million years is a, a pretty long time. This is a, a vowel face of an Olicosira. Sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit. I want to find a round one that we can image. Um, that's not an Olicosira. And we could look at some Olicosira, but these Olicosira aren't super cool. They're this sort of very basic looking Olicosira, so. There's some more interesting looking types in some of the other samples. Things that may be new. In fact, these might be new, but... They're everywhere, so they're kind of boring. We want to find the weird stuff. Hmm. <laughs> well, let's try zooming out a bit. So, those are Olicosira still. So, Olicosira as a genus is a chain forming diatom, and they live in these colonies. And I sometimes like to wax a little poetic about them because uh, they have these long spines that they use, like fingers, to join with the sibling cells that are adjacent to them. And uh, it's equivocable to holding hands with their sisters. So they're, or daughter, I guess, if you want to think of it that way, because they don't really, you know, they're clones. Um, but half of the parent gets added to the daughter. And so like they add half of themselves to their offspring and then make a new one, right? So each half gets divided up among the the children, <laughs> the daughters in this case, and then the daughters end up holding hands with each other for eternity, uh, as long as they stay together. And these diatoms, like this one, have these long spines that are the fingers that are kind of holding the valves together, and they've been holding hands with their sister for um, 10 million years. When I was a kid, I had to hold my hand with my sister when I did something like we got in a fight. We were full, we were forced to like hold each other's hands. And I'm going to tell you that 10 minutes of holding my sister's hands felt like 10 million years to me at the time. It's, it was not enjoyable at that age. 
And that's why I'm so nice to my sisters today. <laughs> uh, just kidding. I am nice to my sisters, though. We're all nice to each other. Where's the cool little round guy? And my beam intensity is too high. So let's look at it in focus at a, at a small beam intensity number. And perfect. It looks really sharp. So speed seven, beam intensity seven, and then I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit. And make sure it's still in focus, which it looks like it is. And we'll take a picture. Perfect little thing. Not sure what it is. Um, oh, there you go. Could do anything. You just got subscribed. Perfect. Thank you for that, um, Evan. Very nice. Um, I love it when community starts giving each other free emotes. Where are we now? Uh, Anna, where have you been? We are now in Lake Idaho. We're looking at 10 million year old diatoms from uh, ancient lakes that no longer exist from the Rocky Mountains. You went to lunch. Oh, that makes sense. I ate lunch today before we started Pacific. You get caught up. Uh, you're glad you caught part of the stream. Good. Uh, I'm glad you could hang out for a bit. Um, if you're not following Pacific Plankton, but you like microscopes and people with nice, calm, relaxing voices and friendly environments in the community, then you should follow Pacific Plankton. And I don't think there's any person on Twitch that I've watched more of their stream than Pacific Plankton. So if that's not a good recommendation for you, I don't know what it is. And I, um, I'm always there, right? Always there. So this is a shout out. Yeah, I gave a shout out to her. Um, also, uh, I feel like what would be, it's a her. Pacific Plankton is a, is a woman. Um, what I think would be really good now, though, is if I put some googly eyes on this thing. You know, the ones that uh, Evan is going to add to the, to the uh, future. And then uh, it'll look like a little cookie with googly eyes. You didn't even have to spend any points. Look at this. And, and, googly. You can type googly in chat and you can make the eyes google all you like. Just, uh, just type the googly, and then the eyes will google. And while you're doing that, um, I'm going to try to put a mustache on it. I'm trying to decide should we go with like a Yosemite Sam mustache? I feel like Yosemite Sam mustache would be a good one for this guy. Like, rootin' tootin' darn rootin' tootin' perfect, right? Okay, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and let me fix it. So let's see, I need to click this and put the, uh, this is some sort of stuff in discoid. I don't know what it is. Undescribed species and probably undescribed genus. I've taken pictures of this thing before and, oh. Uh, I wanted that picture. Come back, stuff in a discoid. There we go. So we can uh, appropriately put a mustache on it, and uh, and you can Google the make the googly eyes go. There we go. Got the googly eyes. I feel like he's one of those mustaches that are right up next to the eyes kind of a guy like that hanging off of the uh the diatom that's a good google right there um perfect right uh and we should probably 
We'll just do a little screenshot of that. And then we'll stuff it into the Discord. If anybody wants to check out the Discord, that's an option. And uh, sometimes I post pictures of things that we take in the channel on there. So it might be worth your while. And uh, we had like to hang out. It's a pretty calm little environment, right? Um, but cool things sometimes happen there. All right, I'm just gonna shake up a little and then we'll take the googly eyes off and the mustache off. Perfect. Uh, let's call that your nightcap. Good, uh, we'll see you later, uh, corkboard. And uh, I will probably end the stream in another 10 minutes or so anyhow, so you're not missing much. That's all I'm gonna say about that. Because it's getting close to time for me to go home. And also that lightning storm is probably working its way here. And I wanna be home in time for it. I also have to get that microscope home so I can uh, maybe do a microscope stream. We'll see. Maybe lightning, maybe microscope, probably one of the two, um, so that I don't have to work on my lecture, which sounds gross. But uh, of course, if I don't do it today, I have to do it tomorrow. So maybe I'll do part of it today. We'll see. This is good. A nice, calm stream where we put mustaches on diatoms and uh, look at 10 million year old stuff and the subscribers and viewers can chat with me as much as they like and uh, and people can go to sleep on it if they want you're gonna wake up on your keyboard and you have a message for me it'll just be like x x x x x x x x z z z z x x x x x x from having fallen asleep oh oh look at this guy he's huge There's a big one. See how round it looks? All right, let's zoom in. We'll get it nice and clean, image-wise. And then zoom back out. There's a big round one. That's a cycloteloid. Let's go look at that and make sure it's in focus. Somewhere around here. And then I'm going to center it. I will zoom in a little bit. And voila. This is the content you come for. None of that knowledge stuff. Uh, well, we can put some mustaches on whatever you'd like. Um, I have other mustaches. In fact, we have this one that's like uh, a jokey face. And we have this whole beard. I feel like uh, this is, oops, I moved the wrong thing. I need to chat so I can figure out where that goes. Uh, right there. Uh, we can put this beard on one. What? Why does he keep grabbing the wrong thing? I want the beard. Just like a big old bearded diatom. There. It's like a Astro Canuck diatom. If you're not following our friend Astro Canuck, you might consider it. He does uh, some photography from... Uh, telescope. You may catch us later. All right, good. We'll see you. Um, Cyanophyte, thanks for hanging out. And let's see. I feel like we still need to add the googly eyes, though. We can't, can't just not have 
can't not have googly eyes. Just the beard by itself. That's weird, right? Sam <laughs> Chung, thank you for the uh, subscription for for Astro Canuck. You know he's one of our uh, favorite streamers. I'm just gonna make it try to look like him. There we go. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe his eyes are a little bit more. I mean, he's Canadian, so maybe his eyes are a little smaller and beadier. You know. I think that looks kind of close to him, right? I don't have glasses, but uh, this is close. And we just put like a pepper down here, and that's uh, in his mouth, and that's uh, Astro Canuck, right? Right? And then we can, we can googly. Nailed it. There he is. And uh, if you can, I recommend you take a screenshot of that and you can post it in Astro Canucks uh, Discord and tell him we drew a diatom picture of him right on stream. Right? And uh, this one's got a little, I don't know what these things are, but they're pretty cool. Uh, all the Kasira things standing off of his head. Uh, we, we got one. We got one of them. Uh, a good picture. Okay. 7-7. Seven, seven. Let's take a picture. It's going to just develop around it now. Perfect. Um, we've had so much fun stuff going on today. Uh, a bunch of follows. We had a bunch of gift subs and subscriptions and tons of people hanging out in the chat and yeah it's been two hours and 35 minutes so you know it's getting close to my time to stop um, we've got about five minutes left so I think we'll probably make this our last picture and I'll try to find somebody to go raid that we haven't raided in a little while um, and I think maybe next time I stream from the scanning electron microscope, we'll look at ants. And I'll try to see if I can set up something with science so that they can be in the channel on Discord with me while we look at some ant stuff. So um, that'll probably be the next stream that we do. Um, for this stream, why don't we go chase down my friend Num the Geek uh, and give them a raid. I'll always enjoy them. And Numb the Geek is currently trying to raise money for a children's hospital. And so, um, for Philadelphia. And I very much would appreciate it if you'd at least uh, come along with the raid and give Numb the Geek a listen to. And um, I think you'll like him. Um, he's a great musician. He's very low key and uh, spectacularly will just learn songs for people. It doesn't charge them for any of it. Play whatever songs are on his list for you. You can just tell him anything and he'll try to learn it. Um, especially if it's something that, you know, he could could play. He's not gonna, right? it's gotta be some instrument he plays, but he plays like guitar, a fiddle, a little keyboards, shaky shaky things. Um, and I feel like uh, you can't go wrong with him. He's a super friendly guy and we've been friends on Twitch for a super long time now. So, um, thanks everybody for hanging out and for the subs and for the follows and, um, and all this other stuff that's been going on here in the channel. And also you should give Radio Joe a follow and Radio Joe's, uh, uh, significant other Hannah. Um, if you like music streams, I was going to make a link that's just like music streamers that I can just type like explanation point music with like a list of great musicians that you can listen to, which is mostly what I do on stream when I'm watching stuff. But um, for now, we'll catch you next time. And, um, and thanks for hanging out.